is how you cross over from Israel to Gaza. And right now we're in no man's land. Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied Nick Clegg? And Deputy Prime Minister, what do you think of that? Mr Trump, why should you be president? What makes you fit for the role? Is it just one big ego trip? Thank you very much. People aren't sure they can trust what you say. You say what? things and then it turns out that they're not quite what you say. And if we deliver what we say we're going to deliver. My name's Andy Bell and I've been a journalist for over 30 years. In this podcast series, How Did We Get Here?, I try to provide context and background to a big story in the news by talking to someone with real expertise in the field. This week, feeling a little overwhelmed by the budget, not sure whether Rishi Sunak's been Santa or Scrooge, keen to know not just what's happening now, but where our economy is heading. I've been talking to one of the country's leading economists and one of the best at seeing the big picture. Miata Fanbula used to work in government and is now chief executive with the think tank, the New Economics Foundation. Miata Fanbula, thanks very much for joining us for this edition of How Did We Get Here? The budget. On the face of it, this is obviously a very different budget. It was dominated by COVID and the measures that needed to be taken. Chancellor has been pretty generous, hasn't he, in terms of the emergency support measures? Yes, yeah, so that's the strong point of the budget. It was really strong on emergency support. And, you know, for me, the big move, for example, was extending furlough until September. That was a good call. Doing that, the analysis that we've done at the New Economics Foundation suggests that that would have saved 2.7 million jobs that were at risk. So I think in the short term, the Chancellor did really well where the budget fell short was in the long term. So he did enough to keep the economy on life support, but not enough to help us recover and get fighting fit. Do we have to give some credit already in terms of the measures that have been taken? Because I think even the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, said that the measures the government had already taken had kept unemployment down. Do you agree with that? Without a doubt. Without the furlough scheme, we would be looking at mass unemployment. Uh, So, you know, it has been an absolute lifeline to businesses and an absolute lifeline to workers. And, you know, and to be fair to the government, its pandemic response has been really, really strong. My worry is that the the reverberations of the economic crisis are going to be felt long past the end of the pandemic. And the government cannot, cannot stop support straight away, because if it does, it risks us not recovering quickly, but critically, it risks not do, us not doing the thing that the Prime Minister keeps talking about, which is to build back better. Well, let's talk about things coming to an end, because a lot of people are pointing out the fact that just as the furlough comes to an end in September, universal credit, this um, extra uplift per month, will come to an end as well, just when people are going to need it. What do you think of that? So I think it's uh, completely the wrong call. Um, The Chancellor has really resisted um, extending that £20 uplift in a way that I don't really understand, particularly when you bear in mind that the uplift only accounts for half of the cuts to social security we've seen since, since 2010. We are now in the strange situation in this country where we have almost a third of the people in this country that are living below this thing that's called a minimum income standard. So that's a level of income by which people can stay afloat, that they can afford bread and butter things. And a third of the people in this country cannot afford those things. And so for me, the government should be thinking about more support to people. And it's both people out of work, but also people in work relying on universal credit. You know, we think they should be introducing something like a minimum income guarantee, we've, we've seen trialled in other countries, that would essentially provide an income floor below which no one would fall, £227 a week, so that people can afford to feed their kids, heat their homes and survive through the long, painful recovery that's coming. Now, the, the uplift that's been in place, £20 a week, £80 a month, if that were kept going indefinitely, would that roughly get people to the level that you're talking about with that minimum income guarantee? No, it wouldn't, uh, but it would be a step in the right direction. Uh, so it provides people with about £1,000 uh, a year. Um, and what that basically does, it gets them halfway to where they were in terms of social security support uh, 10 years ago. So the government, in your view, should be finding more money to do this. But obviously what is it? The bill is already something like over £400 billion in terms of support to get through this crisis. I mean, that's a a lot of money already. Where are they supposed to find more money for the sort of thing you're talking about? 
the numbers that are being banded around are big, uh, and I don't think anyone's disputing that over the course of the last year, 400 billion almost, the government has had to borrow a lot. I think there are two things I would say. The first is that yes, they've borrowed, but the critical thing, which the Chancellor didn't really talk that much about, was that you know, the Bank of England has stepped in in a really important way to help out the government. So 92% of the borrowing that's been done has essentially been lent through the Bank of England. Um, and what that means, the Bank of England, yes, it's independent, but it's essentially an arm of the government. So it's the friendliest, most patient creditor the government could hope for. And even if interest rates rise, the Bank of England has the option, which other central banks have taken, at locking the interest on the debt that the government has borrowed over the last year at 0%. So that's the reason why, despite the fact that the if you like, the borrowing's gone up, when you look at the annual cost of financing that debt, it's actually gone down. We're paying less in debt servicing this year than we were at the start of the pandemic. So I think that's the first thing, you've got to think about the spending in the round. For a lot of people, they'll be going, but hang on, that sounds too easy. You're saying we can borrow the money, and then if we want to, even if you know, world interest rates are going up and debt servicing in normal circumstances is getting more expensive, don't worry, the Bank of England can lock it at a very low rate. That just sounds too easy. Surely there, there must be a big downside to that. That's essentially what the Bank of England has decided to do. It's called monetary fiscal coordination. It's a new step. It's essentially using, quantitative easing, the jargon, but printing money in order to buy up debt. So that's just the way it works. Now, what the Bank of England would say is, we don't mind doing this in an emergency context, but we don't want to do this going forward. So I don't think we can borrow for long-term commitments like bolstering social security. I don't think we can borrow for long-term commitments like investing in schools. I think we have to go back to tax. And so on this, the government is right. We need to look at tax. And you take something like corporation tax at 19%, which was already incredibly low, probably lower than it needed to be to incentivize businesses to come to this country. It was already, it was always for me a strange policy that says we're slashing corporation tax to 19% at the same time as we're slashing welfare payments to people to balance the books. So I think it's right that they're looking to increase it and that they're leaving a bit of space in order to do that. Um, I think they should be thinking about other taxes as well, like taxes on wealth. So at the moment we have, you know, if you're earning an income through wages, you pay twice the tax than if you're earning an income through stocks and shares, and that can't be right. So we do need to look at taxation, but for me, I want us to raise taxes to pay for investing in people, investing in community, investing in services. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the right call to raise taxes, to try to bear down on a deficit, which is fundamentally underwritten by the Bank of England. Okay, we will come back to, to what more the government should be doing, but just to come back to this idea of tax, of course, business is paying, going to pay more tax in a couple of years time. But a lot of people that let's call them, you know, middle middle earners, ordinary UK families are also going to be paying more tax because of this freezing of the thresholds. I mean, that's a real tax rise as well. It is. And I think you have to be honest about that. It is a tax rise that's going to um, hit everyone. I mean, I think the two things I'd say about the personal allowance is it is an it's a tax cut uh, that's quite a regressive one. So it tends to benefit higher earners more than a lower earner. So if we think about the increases in the personal allowance since 2010, the top 20% have benefited by six times more than the bottom 20%. So I think it's probably a tax cut that needed to be looked at anyway. In my view, it's the sort of tax cut you'd probably think about scrapping and coming up with something better that does a better job of protecting those on lower incomes and asking those that earn a bit more to shoulder the burden. Okay, what about some of the measures then you would have liked to have seen, uh, which the Chancellor said, you know, one of his ambitions in this budget is to sort of set out how we're going to build a better economy. Uh, where, where do you think he could have gone further uh, in setting out that sort of ambition? Yeah, so I would have liked to have seen three things from him that I didn't see. The first is uh, the boost to the economy. So essentially what he's done, there were two, you know, big measures. One was this uh, super reduction. So it's a big tax break for businesses that essentially choose to invest. The problem with that over the next two years, the problem with that is it's likely to be subsidizing investment that would have happened anyway. And the government's own watchdog, the Office for Budget Responsibility has pointed this out and said that it's skeptical that it will actually lead to additional growth. 
In addition to that, uh, you got the, this free port policy, which again, the jury's out. What the government, in my view, should have done is something akin to what Biden has done, a big fiscal stimulus. So, you know, Biden's fiscal stimulus was about 9% of GDP. Ours was about 4% of GDP. But more importantly, for me, I wanted it to be geared towards greening the economy. Because one of the things that I hope the pandemic would have shown us is that we've got to ramp up our preparation for climate change. Um, you know, we've been advocating 48 billion could have been pumped into creating green jobs and social care jobs that are kind of low carbon. That would have unlocked something like 1 million jobs over the course of the next few years. And he could have taken a big chunk of that and given it down to communities in order to invest in their places to create those jobs. I think the sort of second thing that I would have liked uh, to have seen in this uh, budget is that, you know, the government has been talking about leveling up and they are right. And there were some measures, including creating an office uh, uh, in Leeds, I think it was. And that's all well and good. But actually what we needed was in a big investment program into communities that's held in the hands of local people. So we didn't hear anything about devolving power and resources so that local people are able, whether it's through regional mayors, local combined authorities, in order to steer their local economies to try to make them better. Um, and then for me, the third piece was, you know, I, I wanted to see support for people and that's both through a minimum income guarantee or some sort of floor below which people know they won't fall through this pandemic, but critically investing in services, everything from libraries through to our health service, through to our social care, um, because those are the things that are both the lifeblood of our communities but that will build the foundations for a strong recovery. On that last point, Riata, I mean, at the, the Institute of Fiscal Studies is saying it looks like there's actually going to be extra taken out of non-protected budgets in the next spending round from what they can see if these plans are actually stuck to. Is that the way you see it? Yes. So the government had already penciled in about 10 to 12 billion of cuts um, in non-protected government departments from this year um, in the autumn. They've now chucked in another four billion pounds worth of cuts. Um, and, you know, the Chancellor said, we haven't done austerity, we aren't cutting. And that was disingenuous because they are. And for me, this comes back to the fact that it feels like they haven't learned the lesson of the last 10 years, that actually austerity was a short term failed policy, in my view, because it neither did the job of getting us to a surplus, which is what George Osborne said in 2010, nor did it do the job of building up our communities. In fact, it's stripped away the things that are key for our communities to work and has made our economy less resilient. OK, but I'm sure the government would say, look, we are, for instance, trying to invest in some areas where it's free ports, that's some of which are going to be in deprived areas. There is a fund for 45 towns, for instance, which you can apply for, which uh, where money can be used. Uh, that's a starting point, isn't it? Or what do you think? It was a big budget. There was lots in there. Uh, and I don't think anyone can take that away from the Chancellor. My problem was uh, some of it was sort of fiddling around the edges, like the Towns Fund, which, you know, if the analysis is right, seems to be skewed towards uh, conservative constituencies, which is a bit problematic rather than constituencies uh, that, that are deprived. But more I guess they would say that's ones that they managed to win at the last election, which, you know, Therefore, they are still deprived and therefore should yeah, get some help. Fair enough. I'm sure, that, uh, I'm sure there are some clear, clever formulas that got to the area that, that got to the distribution that they got to. But even then, the scale of those, they tend to be one bit of infrastructure project in this town, a little bit over there. None of them are going to do the job of transforming communities that have been left behind. That required a big concerted intervention. Um, you know, the, the, the big gamble that the government is essentially taking is if we can create some incentives for the private sector to invest, um, if we can create some capital, so, you know, the infrastructure bank they're talking about, I think is a very good idea and something that we've been advocating about. So if we can, you know, incentivize, catalyze investment, that will do the job for us. That's their big gamble. The economy will grow and it will all be fine. For me, that feels like a mighty big gamble because the lesson of the last 10 years is yes, we got the economy to grow. We invested in infrastructure. We got the economy to grow, but wages were stagnant for a decade and people's living standards, you know, the income they bring in, the things they can afford to do, basically flatlined for a decade. And the promise of Build Back Better was that we wouldn't go back and repeat that mistake. And my fear is 
the gamble the Chancellor is taking on where growth is going and how it will look is essentially just going to repeat the mistakes of the last 10 years. And I don't think we can afford to do that. And do you think you'll anyway be able to stick to these plans? I mean, obviously, last year we saw an awful lot of things that were announced and then were almost immediately overtaken. I mean, I mean do, you, do you feel that this is a plan that will hold or is it, is it very much a sort of sticking plaster? I think it will be overtaken by events. So if you look at something like the unwillingness to um, invest in social security and support people, I think when you know the images of kids not being able to be fed, uh, food bank queues increasing, uh, particularly if they do cut off uh, the, the, the 20 pounds uplift uh, come uh, later on in the year. I think all of that will be politically too contentious. And in the way that we saw a U-turn on free school meals, we'll see a U-turn on this. But also, I think, you know, after a year and a bit, when the scale of private sector investment that they're hoping for doesn't materialize, I think they will think, crikey, we need to do more. Um, so I don't think this is the first word. Uh, I, I don't think this is the last word. I think it's the first word. And I think we'll have many iterations. And the frustration is they could just look back at the last 10 years and get some of this stuff right up front. They could look back at the last year. The last year has been, we do something we iterate, we do something, we iterate. Um, and in so, the trajectory is clear on some of this stuff and he could have mitigated some of that by acting in a bigger way in some of the ways that other countries are doing. I mean, quite a big change philosophically for a conservative government though, the sort of thing you're, set, you're setting out. And I think that's the challenge. Uh, that is the challenge because in the end, the last year has been anathema uh, to, I think, uh, Rishi Sunak because he's a conservative chancellor that believes in things like a small state and fiscal conservatism, but he was pragmatic and that was the right thing to do. I think the challenge for him now is the crisis wasn't just the pandemic. We are in a period of multiple crises. So we go from the pandemic to climate change. We go from the pandemic to a living, in, a, a living standard squeeze, an income squeeze that would have been happening for more than a decade. Can you imagine? Unprecedented in our history, 10 years in which people's incomes were flatlined and then potentially another five years in which they drop. And we are in a period of crisis. So the mode he was in in the pandemic, I fear is the mode that he needs to continue maybe not at the same scale or pace, but that is the frame. And at the moment, I think there is a intellectual and ideological tussle, which is why we saw the budget that we did, but I fear events will take over. Yasafandrila, thank you very much for talking to us about the budget. Thank you for having me. Miata Fandula from the New Economics Foundation, with a little of where she thinks the Chancellor got it right and where he didn't. If you thoughts on this or any other podcast, you can email me at andy.bell at itn.co.uk and I'm tweeting it at andybell 5 news And please share, rate and review. Thanks for listening to this edition of How Did We Get Here? There'll be another along soon. <laughs>